Hey everyone, it's uh, Dave Barnett from davidcbarnett.com, blog site, YouTube channel, iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play podcast, li- really wherever they will tolerate me, I'm there. We talk about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses. And today I'm joined by Braden Drake, who is an attorney in Southern California. And uh, Braden, you actually studied your, you, you studied tax law and, and you are a practicing lawyer and I'd like to give you a, li- a little bit of an opportunity to just share your story about how you got to where you are today. Uh, but we're going to be talking today primarily about contracts with customers and small business. Maybe you can give us some background and, and how you arrived uh, to be uh, so knowledgeable about this field. Sure. So basically my brief history is my interest all, all over the place. So in undergrad, I majored in Russian and political science. I studied German. I got my minor in business thought about eight different things for grad school, ended up in law school, got my law degree, passed the bar exam. I actually really loved uh, health law, but then I found a new love for tax law. And that's when I decided to get what's called an LLM in taxation. So that's a master's degree uh, at a law school where the prerequisite is having your Juris Doctorate first. Okay, so, so you actually act as a consultant to CPAs when they run into complex tax issues. Occasionally, yeah. So if they're doing a complex tax return or they have a question about a deduction, they can pay me a consulting fee to research the case law and all of that on the particular uh, tax issue. Okay. Okay. That's neat. Um, How did you come to be working with people, you know, with respect to contracts between businesses and their, their clientele or customers? So contracts is kind of I almost want to say the default service if you decide that you're going to go out as a sole proprietor and practice business law. So if you're going to be a business attorney, typically you're forming new businesses and you're drafting contracts, Uh, things like mergers and acquisitions for large companies, those types of things. That's what you're going to be doing at a large law firm. So if you're going to be a solo attorney, uh, you really need to know your contracts because that's what most of your small business clients are going to need. Okay. And, and, And you mentioned the word client, right? And, and, and I want to bring this up because a lot of people who are thinking about business don't often stop and, and consider the people they serve. Now, I mean, in my past, I, had, I held the various licenses and things. And so we became very attuned to the difference between customers and clients and stuff. And maybe we can talk a little bit about that. If, if someone owns a business, what is the difference between customers and clients? And, and how would that frame someone's attitude about how they interact with those people? Sure. So I'll, I'll save like all of the real uh, technical jargon for your copy editors and your marketing consultants, but I differentiate them as customers by products, clients by services. Okay. So I have two businesses. I also have an, an online business where I sell contract templates and courses. Those individuals I would call my customers. And then at my law firm, I have clients. Okay. So, so people who walk up, buy a thing, pay, leave, that's a customer. Right. So we're thinking about a corner store as customers, but someone who you have to sit down and talk with, understand their point, understand their perspective, understand what they want, put thought into what you're delivering for them. That's a client. Yes. That's how I look at it. Uh, When you get into the marketing world, you can use some different terms as well. So like in my course, I would call you my student because it sounds better than customer, obviously. But then when you're talking about clients for services, there's also the importance of what's just a routine client. And then if you're in a professional capacity, you should understand understand the term fiduciary. So if you're a fiduciary to your client, that's kind of a whole separate tier. Having certain responsibilities because you're perceived as an expert. Right. It's uh, So as an attorney, you serve as a fiduciary. So in my role, I have to do what's best for my client. So if I'm hired by a company, a small company, my client would be the company and not the individual that contacted me through that company. So I have a fiduciary obligation to act in the best interest of the company, Mm -hmm. even if that might not be in the best interest of that individual person's bank account. Okay. All right. I understand. And so what you're talking about essentially is a more complex relationship. And, and I guess where I wanted to steer this was towards the, the agreements that exist. You know, um, I guess if I'm a customer of a store, I walk in, I pick something up off the shelf, they give me a receipt once I pay them. Um, really, that's the documentation of our, 
of our transaction, right? You know, right. I walk away with the object I purchased in a receipt. In, in a client relationship, we can have a much more complicated agreement. So what kinds of things need to be spelled out when, when a business has a relationship with, with, a, with a client? So I always tell people, you, you should have an agreement that explains the what, when, where, why, am I missing any other W words? And even sometimes, um, or sorry, what, where, when, and how, and even sometimes why. You can put the why right. in a contract. But basically, you cover all the bases. Uh, why do we have this agreement? How am I serving you? What are you paying me? When am I providing this service? And you just want to run through all of that. Okay. And so if, if I'm running a business right now, and I'm, so let's say I'm a photographer, okay, and I'm taking pictures of people, um, what, to what degree should we be documenting these agreements? Like if, if somebody emails me and simply says, I want to hire you to take some pictures of my family on the weekend, can you come to my house at three o'clock? What do you charge? Like, I, cause I get the impression when I'm dealing with a lot of business owners that they're doing transactions without actually having any kind of formal paperwork involved. And it, so I wanted to get your opinion on that and, and kind of hear why that may be okay or maybe it's not okay. Yeah, so you don't want to do that <laughs> is what I tell people. So legally speaking, you can actually you can actually reach a contractual ob obligation through back and forth emails. Uh, but if you ever had a dispute and you went to court, uh, you'd spend a lot of time arguing about evidence rules and all that sort of stuff to bring in all, all of those things. Whereas if you reduce your agreement down to one document, I typically will call it your client service agreement if it's between you, the business owner, and the client, and you put all the terms in there, then it's very clear. So that covers you better legally. It's going to provide better evidence for your agreement. But it also, and I think this is the most important aspect, is a really good preventative tool. So I do work with a lot of photographers. One of the big things for photographers is they will never give you raw images because that's their intellectual property. They provide you with a specified amount of edited images. So that will be stated in their contract. And if you address that before the client pays you, then they likely aren't gonna have a problem with it later on. Um, whereas if you don't address it and they ask for those photos a year from now, now you have to explain to them and they're probably already angry and, and those types of things. So it also diffuses problems before they happen. Okay, uh, you brought up something very interesting, uh, going to court. Um, <laughs> You know, one of the things that I hear from a lot of small business owners is they'll say, well, you know, I'm involved in transactions that are quite small. You know, no one, no reasonable person is ever going to, you know, sue, go to court, et cetera. Um, I, I, and I know that the United States has a reputation of being a more litigious place than other parts of the world. I, I just wanted to get a real perspective from someone operating in this industry. Like, like what kinds of lawsuits have you observed happening? Like how small can these problems be and still end up being involved with courts? So I try to stay out of litigation as much as possible because it's not very fun for me, but I have done a lot of consulting for people who are on their way towards litigation. So what I can tell you, and this is different by jurisdiction here in the district where I am in Southern California, if you have a lawsuit for $10,000 or less, you can take that to small claims court. Mm -hmm. And our small claims court actually does not even allow attorneys, which is nice right. because that prevents the party with more money just scaring the other party typically. And it costs about a hundred dollars to file your case. And then you have to, you have to pay to serve that person. So you'll see that happen. Typically people won't sue for less than a thousand dollars unless it's really personal, but you can certainly see lawsuits from 1,000 to 5,000. And I've seen that happen a lot. I used to mediate at small claims court uh, because your out-of-pocket cost is just a couple hundred bucks. So if you believe you're entitled to $2,000, that's only 10% that you're going to spend on your court fees. So it can happen there. Um, above $10,000, I feel like there's a really big gap because typically mm -hmm. you're not going to want to pay attorneys. If you're um, stand to only gain like 15,000 because you're going to eat up most of that in attorney's fees. But certainly if you have these really high dollar contracts, you could face an actual civil lawsuit in civil court. Yeah, that, that's interesting because, um, you know, I'm just, as you're telling the story about small claims court, I'm remembering my own history. Uh, at one time I owned uh, some apartment buildings 
And I once had some tenants and they, they left the place in a complete mess in a state of disrepair. And the damage deposit that I had didn't cover it. And so I ended up suing them in small claims court. And here I, under a certain amount, I think the filing fee was 50 bucks. And, yeah. you know, so it was an interesting experience for me. They didn't show up. I obtained a judgment. <laughs> I didn't know anything. I like, I mean, afterwards, I think that they, it almost was like them punishing me again because I invested time in going through that process. But I can see where if, if I had a, a problem with an actual business where they really did have assets, I could go attach my, my judgment to. Um, I could really create a lot of headaches for somebody for a very small investment of time and money. Yeah. And a lot of the times, the other, the other inconvenience is going to be just going to court. So if you're in a, like a business to business relationship, especially, then you, I'm located in San Diego and I sue someone who's located in Virginia based on a contract we had that was uh, governed under California law. They're going to say, that's not worth my time. And I also don't need a judgment on my business. I only owe you $3,000. So let's work this out informally. That's how I see it play out most often. I actually just dealt with one of these last week. It was someone who was working as an independent contractor for a business owner and that business owner said, you're stealing my intellectual property, my copyright, you performed work for me, now you're using it. Uh, my client said, you never paid me $5,000, technically I could sue you. This person cross-threatened. And then I basically picked up the phone, I had a 10 minute long phone call with the other attorney and we basically were like, this is not worth the money mm -hmm. to go to court, small claims or civil. Um, let's just figure out an agreement and have our clients sign it. And then it was done. So I always tell people, resolve your disputes informally. If you can, you'll know at which point it's no longer going to work. And then you can try to get an attorney who's not going to be too legit litigious to resolve the suit before it gets filed. So in, in today's day and age of the internet being the medium or the marketplace where a lot of business is starting to happen. You mentioned someone in California doing business with someone in Virginia. Uh, I'm guessing that the, the internet facilitated them to be able to, to communicate with each other and everything. Um, are you seeing that a lot of disputes between parties instead of ending up in court are ending up being resolved by people like credit card companies or PayPal? Like, because it would seem to me that they do a lot of dispute resolution between parties uh, where they've facilitated the payment? Yeah, you can definitely do that. I know people will go through collections, but that's usually a very cut and dry situation. So it was like, hey, you buy my program, you buy, you bought my program on a payment plan, you only made two payments, but you consumed all the content. Uh, now you owe me the rest of the money. So that one's pretty easy. Once you get into this, did you adequately perform on the contract? Did you give me what you said you were gonna do? Then you have a dispute as to whether the one person even owes you the money you're claiming that they owe. And that's where you can't really rely on those other services. Okay. I, I once actually had a case where um, I was engaged uh, to do some evaluation work and I, and I have an engagement agreement and it's a two page agreement and it just spells out, this is what I'm doing and these are the laws it's governed under and this is what I'm supposed to do and here's when it will be done by. And, and, you know, this was a couple of years ago. So they signed the piece of paper and they faxed it over to me. I'm dating myself. They faxed it over. Um, and I accepted a credit card and for whatever reason, uh, somebody disputed the charge when they got the bill and visa contacted me or my, my merchant account processor contacted me to say that there was this chargeback. I provided that contract and the whole thing was resolved in a matter of days in my favor. Because I had this thing signed, you know, it was clearly saying, this is what you're doing and this is what you owe me and these are the terms of payment. And so clearly that was a case where my, my, bait, my butt was saved by the fact that I actually had this, this thing in place. What should somebody, if somebody owns a business right now, we mentioned what should be in a contract. Like, how do you overcome people who say they're afraid of scaring potential clients or customers with something that looks too complex or scary? So a few things. First of all, if the client or customer that you're working with is afraid to sign a contract, that's not someone you probably want to work with anyway. 
So it was actually kind of funny. I went to a new CrossFit gym yesterday and I always read the liability waivers when they give them to me. And they're like, oh, you're actually reading that? And I said, yeah. And they thought I like didn't want to sign it. And I said, no, to me, it's just like an academic interest. But um, I, I always, I'm actually, I'm actually reading it because the more thorough their contract is, I know the more seriously they're taking their business and then I respect them more and I think I'm going to get a better service from them. Interesting. So that, yeah, that's another reason. I think having a really good contract says, Hey, this is, this is a legit business. Uh, I took time to write this. I am considering all of the things that could happen in our, in our arrangement, whether it's a client or a customer relationship. And I want to make sure that both of us have a mutual understanding going into this transaction. Okay. And so if, you know, what, I, I guess if, if I'm operating a business and I've got these ongoing relationships with people that have, that have been, you know, serving for a long time, one of the things that I've heard people say is, well, you know, we've had this ongoing relationship with this person to now bring in this new level of documentation could represent, you know, a problem. We don't want to upset the apple cart kind of thing. What, have you seen somebody's business evolve to the point where they needed to kind of re redefine relationships with, with more formalized paperwork? So I haven't worked with those one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, most of my, most of my clients based on the niche market that I'm in don't have a lot of ongoing relationships with individuals, or if they do, it's always on a very defined scope of service. So there's always a new agreement. It's easier mm -hmm. to introduce an agreement at that point in time, but there's never, there's never a problem with uh, pointing the finger at your attorney and say, hey, look, you know, this has been great for the past 10 years I've been working with you, uh, but my attorney and my CPA are really wanting me to start documenting. So I'd like you to just look at this contract, which basically just summarizes what we've already been doing for X number of years. So it's just a written piece of paper that already states how much you've been paying me and what I've been performing for you. Okay. And you know, you, you had mentioned, um, maybe a little, maybe before we hit record that you do work with a lot of creative people. Are there any bits of advice that you can give for people that are, you know, sort of in that artistic category that are creating things as far as protecting the, the stuff that they're working on? Do they face any particularly different challenges from most other businesses? Yeah. Whenever you're a creator, you're going to have intellectual property concerns so if you're producing content, uh, you have copyright issues to deal with and then potentially trademark issues if you're a graphic designer. But then the other thing is, is just formalizing all of your agreements into writing because when you're not, when you don't come from, I don't really know what to call my industry, but like a white collar office environment where you're pushing around a lot of papers and you're more just like into your creative studio doing ceramics or whatever, uh, all these documents might be super overwhelming, but I would say uh, keep it simple. Your contracts don't have to be super complicated and make just make sure that you have them. Um, it's one of the best things you can do to protect your business. I, I guess a, a great example would be sometimes you do business somewhere where they have this kind of standard thing with check boxes and they just check off some things and don't check off other things, kind of customizing the the thing to whatever it is you're doing, right? You know, we, we see this a lot. Uh, that's the kind of thing that, that most businesses should invest in. Yeah. And the other thing is, is I will see a lot of, I do see a lot of really bad contracts. Um, and I'll tell you why they're bad because I think that's helpful. So if people are either getting free templates online or they're buying them, which isn't necessarily a problem, but here in the States, especially we have different bodies of law that govern every single state. So if you're buying a contract that was drafted in Texas, some of the provisions might not be applicable in California. So that's the main problem. Secondary problem is your template has provisions in it that are not applicable to your service or your product. So it could be talking about one thing and you're doing another thing. Um, I've also seen a lot of contracts where it's clear that they got a template that talked about payment terms, uh, but then whoever bought it, so the new business owner decides that they wanna have their own payment terms. So they add those, but they add them into like a different paragraph. So now, now as your client, I'm reading this contract and I see like contradicting information about when and how I'm supposed to pay you. So the takeaways really should be, you need to cover all of your bases and make it super clear. So I, I always suggest uh, obviously working with an attorney, but if you have a really simple contract, 
just make sure that whoever's reading it is going to know what's in there. So hand it to like your friend, your spouse, whoever, and have them read it and then say, now explain to me how you think this business relationship is going to work and see if they can tell you what you're going to be providing to them, when they're going to be paying you, what's going to happen if they don't pay you on time, what happens if they cancel, and if they can provide all that information based on the document you gave them. Well, it's interesting because when I, when I was going through my training, um, you know, back when I had my business brokerage office, uh, here where I live, I had to hold a real estate license. And so we spent a lot of time talking about contracts and stuff. And one of the things that I really took home and, and from my previous career, actually uh, selling yellow page ads a long time ago, what it was always drilled into us is that the contract is merely supposed to represent what people have agreed to anyway. So if you can't understand what the contract is talking about, then it's not a very good representation of what you think that you're doing. Right. right. So it's, it's, it's gotta be understood. And uh, I always like, for example, when, um, when examples are put in, right. Especially if it's talking about calculating a late fee, like this is how we calculate late fees. And here's an example. If you owe us a hundred dollars and you don't pay us, then you owe us $2 extra or something like that. It's, it makes it very, very simple. Um, I have a funny story though about a contract with a hotel. So I was doing um, a workshop up in the, the Toronto area a couple of years ago and I was renting a meeting room from a hotel and the person I spoke with said that I had to sign the contract in order to rent the room. And I said, okay, send it to me. And they sent it to me and it was, they sent it to me in word. So it was like <laughs> a word document and somebody else's name was throughout it. So they, they changed the name to be my name at the very top of the contract, but someone other his other client's name was throughout it. So I knew they just like copied it from somebody else's file. And so I went through and I changed, I changed that other person's name to my name, but where it said what the room rental rate was, there was some other stuff to do with food service and catering that had been left in there. So I deleted that because I wasn't getting any food service. And then there was a line saying that there was a standard gratuity and I just deleted it. And okay. so I left it simply saying that the room rate was a certain amount plus sales tax. And I, I printed it off. I signed it and I faxed it to her and I didn't hear anything about it until the day I was there. And I, I did my thing in the room and then, and then she came up the, the, um, the person at the front desk tried to charge me for this gratuity. And I said, no, there's no gratuity there. We didn't get food service. They're like, Oh no, no, the gratuity is standard. We charge it to everybody. And I said, well, it's not really a gratuity then is it? If you, if, if it's really just a fee. And I said, I, I don't think that's in my contract. And she said, yes, it's in everybody's contract. And then she pulled it out and saw that it wasn't in my contract. And um, so I didn't pay it. And uh, afterwards I kind of got a chuckle out of it, knowing I would likely never be allowed to go back to that hotel again. But um, it just sort of highlights one of the things that you probably should not do if you're using an agreement with a customer. Don't sit in a Microsoft Word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, there are like a few big takeaways. I'm saying three, but it might be two or four. Okay. But a few big takeaways from that story. First, don't send contracts in Microsoft Word. If you're going to actually ask people to print and sign them, which is a pain and I don't recommend you doing because a lot of your clients won't want to do that, uh, send it in a PDF. Um, but ideally, all, I always tell my clients to have a CRM, client relationship management mm -hmm. software where you can send the contracts and get e-signatures. Yeah. Uh, my average turnaround time is like just a few hours by the time I send someone my contract and my invoice to get it signed and paid. So that's what I recommend. Uh, second tip is include, have an introduction paragraph, which defines the parties. So if I were gonna draft a contract for us, this is like a pro level attorney tip for you. It would say uh, David Barnett, owner of insert business name, DBA, all that important lingo. And then I'd put in parentheticals, quotes, consultant mm -hmm. agrees to provide services to Braden Drake, owner of Braden Drake Law, insert brackets and quotes, client. And then in the rest of the contract, never address the parties by name, just yeah. use consultant and client. So you've defined those terms. And then when it comes to the scope of services or what you're providing to them, I always 
tell people to put that in a, an attachment. So then you'll have a paragraph that says scope, scope of services. David agrees to provide services as noted in attachment A to client. And then that way, whenever you're redoing your contracts, all you have to remember to change is the names in the introduction paragraph and the services in the attachment. Anything else that needs to be changed, like late fees, if you want to negotiate that, you can. But try to include as much as you can in the attachment, and then you won't have that kind of problem pop up. Right. And these just become addenda to the contract. They're just added on. Exactly. Or like sometimes you are going to have blanks in your contract. What I do is if there's ever anything in the contract that needs updated for every single client, uh, I make a checklist for my clients. So before they send out a contract, they can say change name introduction paragraph, change due date, change price, and then check them all off and send it out. Oh, great, great piece of advice. Braden, if people would like to meet you online, get more information or contact you, uh, how can they find you? So my primary platform where I hang out the most is Instagram. If you have a personal or a business Instagram, feel free to follow me. It's Braden Adam Drake, B-R-A-D-E-N, and then Adam and Drake like the rapper. And my website is BradenDrakeLaw.com. Okay. I'm not on Instagram. <laughs> I work most, so I told you I work mostly with uh, like artists, graphic designers, photographers. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. That's where all of my clients hang. I out. keep I keep hearing about Instagram. I, I, maybe it's something I should. Look it's at. been a pretty powerful business tool. I have to. I have to admit. All right. Thank you very much, Braden. It's been great to talk with you today, and amazing, useful tips. And uh, as always, everyone listening, if you if you don't ever want to miss any of my interviews or videos or talks about small business, make sure you sign up for my list over at davidcbarnettlist.com. And with that, we'll see you later. Thanks, Braden. See ya.